Uh, I do want to show you this image, Joe, because this is very startling. This shows you uh, if you adequately beef up your home and, and make it, you know, more hurricane resistant. The fellow who owns this particular home that I'm going to show you, this is in Mexico Beach, Florida, had it fortified to withstand 250 mile per hour winds and a host of other things. And it is virtually unscathed. I'm told, in fact, uh, not so much as a frame fellow of that house. Look at the area around it. Look at what this guy did to make it as hurricane resistant, hurricane proof as it possibly can. Now, obviously, to set standards like that for all homeowners in a, in a damaged region uh, would, would, would obviously be very, very pricey. But it's an issue I want to take up with Douglas Holtz Eakin, um, who, who crunches numbers. The Congressional Budget Office did that, did the same for John McCain, looks at the, this sort of stuff. You know, as soon as you see something like that, you know, Doug, the immediate thing that hits you is uh, there are ways to prepare for these sort of things. They're expensive. Um, and in, in the case of this owner, uh, they, they, they make the cost of construction a whole lot more. But if we mandated that, I don't know if that'd be a good or bad thing, period, because it would exponentially drive up the cost to the government besides, right? Well, you're going to pay before, you're going to pay after, Neil. Right? Yeah, if you have right. a mandate for, for stricter construction uh, 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 standards and a higher cost, it comes out in the construction cost. If you don't, the insurance policies that go to that house are going to be a lot more expensive. And even in Florida, you can see a difference between the standards they have along the Atlantic coast, which is the traditional uh, uh, place where hurricanes have caused a lot of damage, and the panhandle, where the standards are not near as strict. And, and some of the devastation I think you see in Mexico Beach and other places is going to make them rethink that difference. Yeah, the, the reason why they're not as strict in the panhandle is they, of course, hadn't seen anything like this in the better part of a century. Right. So they felt either they could dodge a bullet or the bullet wouldn't be that severe. This one obviously was. But I am beginning to wonder because there is a good deal of rebuilding in the same communities that are hit, oftentimes again and again. Now, you could say the same about uh, the folks that rebuild in, in tornado alleys and all of that. So it's, a, it's hard to draw a line here. But it is interesting in the case of this one homeowner who decided to, to bite the bullet and to, and to, to reinforce right. his home to the degree that he had, uh, that it really did survive this very, very nicely. And, and whatever the upfront cost, net net it's a, it's a huge savings it's uh you know it's an amazing picture i mean I, i'm with you you just look at it the devastation that surrounds that house it shows that technically it can be done and now that homeowner will not face the same insurance costs reconstruction costs that other homeowners are going to face and so that's the trade-off you have to decide and you know there's also the the sort of personal loss that comes with the damages to your home and and the the belongings so uh, I think it is a, a reminder that you can rethink the way you do the economics of this beachfront development. And the, the only thing I would hope is that the federal government not be subsidizing people inappropriately to build in the path of hurricanes. That's historically been a problem with our flood insurance program. It isn't priced effectively. It implicitly says, hey, go ahead, build the house there. Don't worry about it. And you come back to a great deal of devastation and loss. Yeah, and we do minor fixes. I know after Sandy in the New Jersey, New York area, they required homes right. to be a little bit further back from the shore or up on, on pilings or stilts, uh, for lack of a better term, to mitigate the damage. But it is what it is. I am wondering, you know, uh, from your days at the CBO, uh, effectively we're told that there's no money in the till for FEMA, and this has been a rough hurricane <laughs> season. Now, we, the funds are always provided for cleanups and fix-ups and that. But we never seem to, to have a way to deal with this. Yeah, there's never been a really effective uh, disaster budget, uh, a forward-looking act by Congress that says, all right, let's be realistic. Uh, we're going to have some uh, disasters. They're going to be in the form of floods or hurricanes or, or forest fires. Let's put some money aside in advance so that when they occur, we'll have the funds on tap. Instead, I think Congress prefers to be seen riding into the rescue. Something awful happens. They vote the money and out it goes. But it, it, it does lead you to underestimate the expected cost of these things because they aren't putting it on the books. All right. Um, Doug, thanks for rolling with the news and these developments. I always appreciate it, my friend. Uh, Doug uh, Holtz-Eakin, the American Action Forum president, former uh, director of the Congressional Budget Office.